few years. Don't ever take for granted what you have here. <clears throat> My voice is just a little weak, but I'm strong in spirit. <clears throat> and it's not so important that you hear my voice, but that we hear his voice. Yeah. Can you say amen? amen? And so I'm honored to be here when Pastor Keith invited me. I am here by invitation, but I believe I'm sent. Yeah. And so I want to be found faithful to God's sending and uh, to deliver to you what he's placed in me in any way to the end that you might be established and encouraged and strengthened in the things of God. How many know this is a critical hour that we're living in? And uh, knowing a little history of this country uh, and anybody that does knows that uh, for a number of reasons, this is really quite a critical day that we're living in. It's sobering times, and we've come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Such a time as this. I'd like to get right into the word and then uh, bring to you what God's placed on my heart for this morning. I'm going to begin by turning to Luke chapter 4. This will be our beginning place. And we will make our way over to the book of Nehemiah. But Luke chapter 4, it says Jesus, in verse 14, <clears throat> Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee. And there went out a fame of him through all the region round about. Let me just stop and make a comment. He returned in the power, but how many know he just came back from fasting? Yeah. And so I pray that as you complete this church time of prayer and fasting, and you enjoy your cupcakes. <laughs> Man, if I knew you were having them, I would have changed my flight for Wednesday. <laughs> but that you will have crossed the threshold into a greater dimension of the power of the Spirit. How many know we don't fast to get God to do something? David said, I afflicted my soul with fasting. I love the next verse. And it says, and my prayer returned into my bosom. Fasting helps to, uh, what's the phrase? First things first, what's the phrase? Yeah, fasting helps us to put first things first. Can you say amen? amen. Let's continue. Verse 15, and he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. But he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. That means that he was searching and looking. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He had sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. I, I think that's an interesting phrase because the possibility, if you are bruised, you know what a bruise is? A bruise is internal bleeding. Did you ever get a bruise and it turns black and blue? That means the blood never made it out but it stayed under the skin, you were bruised. And there are people that have been bleeding a long time that have suffered deep bruises. I think it's interesting that he says to set at liberty them that are bruised because bruises have a way of incarcerating you and holding you hostage 
but how many know your future doesn't have to be sabotaged by the bruises of the past? Because he still could set at liberty them that are bruised. He goes on to say to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and he gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in a synagogue were fastened upon him. Now he deliberately looked for the place in Isaiah. Now in our Bibles, we have chapters and verses marked. And it's found in Isaiah chapter 61. And he read the first three verses. But it's a portion of the whole text. Now, before Jesus went to the cross, he celebrated the Passover meal with his disciples. He had done that before, at least for three years. But with this one, he said, and it was with great desire, I desired to sup with you because his hour had come. They never fully understood when he would talk about when he would talk about having to be crucified and then being buried and rising the third day. But he knew that his hour had come. And at that last supper, and it's recorded in the Gospel of John most extensively, and it's recorded several chapters in John 13 all the way to John 16, and then in 17, they go out to a place called Gethsemane. And he prays the high priestly prayer, so on and so forth. But for all those chapters, Jesus is kind of preparing them for his departure. He tells them how that he no longer calls them servants, but now he calls them friends. He tells them that whatever the Father gave him for them, he gave it to them. He commends them with his 12. He says, you are they that continued with me in my trials. And he is in that time, the conversation is dominated by him speaking about another comforter that will come. And that's when the emphasis of what he has to say centers on the Holy Spirit. Not before, but at that point. And he tells them how that they're going to be in sorrow and the world is going to rejoice for a little while because of his crucifixion. But then he told them, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. He says, I will not leave you comfortless, but I'm going to send another comforter. He's going to guide you. He's going to direct you. The essence of his ministry is one of revelation. He will take the things of mine and reveal. Someone say reveal. He will reveal them to you. You see, they were primarily impacted by the manifestation of Jesus' ministry, but there was many things they didn't understand because of where they were at. And it was not really his ministry, Jesus' ministry, to reveal, he would explain, but he told them on one occasion, there's many other things that I have to tell you, but you're not able to bear them now. But then he would put his, direct their attention, but when he, the spirit of truth is come, he'll lead and he'll guide you in truth. And so the primary, the primary ministry of the Holy Spirit is threefold. Three. Three is the number associated with God. Father, Son, Spirit, death, burial, resurrection. Threefold. First, the first thing that they received from the Spirit was power. He's an empowered. Second thing they received is revelation. And you see that in Acts chapter 2 when Peter 
was preaching, suddenly Peter's revealing to the ones he's preaching to who David was talking about when he quoted Psalm 16. He said, men and brethren, let me freely speak to you of, our, of, of David. He is both dead and buried in the sepulchers with us unto this day. But when David says, you will not leave my soul in hell, nor suffer thine holy one to see corruption. He didn't speak of himself. And he is now by revelation saying what was spoken. He said, as a prophet, he spoke and he began to preach Christ and how that Christ is raised from the dead. He received spirit power. Now he's flowing in spirit revelation. That's the second dimension, revelation. The third dimension of the spirit is transformative. The Bible says how that we all would open face, see through a glass the glory of the Lord and are changed into the same image even as by the Spirit. So he comes to empower he comes to reveal, and ultimately, he comes to transform. And because of the ministry of the Spirit, you and I then can become part of and fulfill and walk in the next dimension of the text in Isaiah. So Jesus declared his part. I've come to set the captives free. I've come to bind up the brokenhearted. I've come to set at liberty them that are bruised. And I've come to preach, to declare the year of Jubilee. And he came to preach the good news. But turn to your neighbor and say, that's part one. Then it goes on to say, and to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, in verse 3, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called planted trees of righteousness. Amen. Wow. And then it goes on to say, it gets better, and now they will build the old wastes. They will raise up the former desolations. They will repair the waste cities and the desolations and the broken condition of many generations. So the formerly captive ones, brokenhearted ones, blind ones, bruised ones, through my work, I take them out of that state. They're no longer that. And then I go to be with the Father. And now the Spirit takes the ones I delivered by my blood, by my death, by my resurrection. It is a deliverance from. The whole essence of Jesus' ministry was a deliverance ministry. The whole essence of the culmination at Calvary is a deliverance yeah. Yeah. when you believe upon the cross and the resurrection. It's delivering me from. But then Jesus handed the baton to the Spirit. Jesus himself ascended up to heaven, but his ministry never left the earth. It's, it's seen in probably one of the clearest types in the Old Testament of Elijah being brought up, but his mantle came down. So that when Elisha, who never did a miracle, he only served the man of God who was doing the miracles. But when he took the same, someone say the same mantle. When he took the same mantle and he smote the waters of the Jordan, he crossed over a threshold by the same mantle into a new miraculous operation. 
And that to me is one of the clearest types of what took place in that upper room, the same mantle. Because Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord hath anointed me. But now the spirit of the Lord had anointed them. So the baton was passed. So this is not only a delivered Peter, this is not only a delivered John, this is not only a delivered James and his disciples having been delivered. Now they are empowered. Now they are moving in revelation and now they're being transformed. They become his extension of the continued work that he started. They become part two. They become the continuation of Christ in the earth. Only this time, it's through a new body. And a member, a many membered body. I'm not telling you anything new. I just can't figure out anything more exciting than that to tell you. Because we are involved in part two, Caleb. Think about it. Think about it. The baton has been passed to us. And the Holy Spirit is not just a stand in for Jesus. No. The Holy Spirit was given to quantify and to bring the work of Christ into an exceeding great expression. So he's not a fill-in. He's not a stand-in. He takes the work that Christ did and he exponentially expands the possibility of its effect in all the world through the generations. And you say, but how? Through you and through me. At your 10-year anniversary, I just want to emphasize that all that Jesus did for me was not simply to deliver me from, but to deliver me for. I've been delivered for a purpose. In fact, I've been saved according to his purpose and grace. The whole reason he saved me was because it was a criteria for me to get into a situation where now I could fill the purpose he always had in his mind. As long as I was a lost man, as long as I was dominated by sin, come on. Israel could not worship God in Egypt. They couldn't serve God in Egypt. He had to bring them out of the house of bondage because God had a plan for them as a nation. And where he wanted to bring them and what he wanted to do could not be facilitated in a land of bondage. And what God envisioned for every one of you and every one of us, he envisioned as people that were made after his own image, after his own likeness. The problem is I was born with graffiti called sin. I had a twistedness in my spirit called iniquity. And so Christ came to deal with that, to free me, to then throw me into a category where the Spirit of God could recreate me and make me the man God always had in mind. Woo! Man, the prospect of that just thrills me. I've been serving God 44 years, and it doesn't get old. It just gets deeper. It just gets deeper. There's nothing more that I can get excited about with the prospect and the possibility of what God desires to do in my life and what can be done because of the Spirit of God alive within me. The problem with so many is that we settle and we don't set our sights high enough. But put Paul in prison and he'll still say things, I'm reaching. You could put my feet in stocks. You could put me in bonds, and I'm 
reaching. I'm reaching for the high calling of God. You could leave me in a cell and I'm reaching. That man, you may incarcerate his body, but his heart is set free. Because he only saw himself as the prisoner of one. So when Caesar came to arrest him, Paul basically said, too late, I've already been arrested. On a road called Damascus. You could throw me in a cell, but I'm the prisoner of the Lord. Hallelujah. And you know, isn't it amazing, and I don't want to get off track, but isn't it amazing that the most lasting work of Paul came from the depths of when he was incarcerated the most? Come on, these are the letters we're reading today. The ongoing ministry of Paul was when the circumstances were most inconvenient. Why? Because a man never saw himself as a victim to circumstance. So when you throw him in prison, he'll tell Timothy, hey, bring my parchment and bring my quill. I got some letters to write. You got to chop his head off to shut him up. Come on. Because what will ooze out of every orifice in his body is ministry. I mean, I really, I mean, when you're in Philippians, he said, hey, I just want you to know some they of Caesar's household greet you. Oh, my God. He's getting into the family now. But that's the kind of man he was, and that's the kind of heart. God wants us to have. Can you say amen? amen? So Jesus told them, he said, for your sake, I must go. Because as long as I'm here, you'll reach the threshold of the possibility of where you could go. He said, but in that day, I will no longer be with you. I'll be in you. Once I get on the inside, Watch what I could do. I'll lead you, guide you, and change you. Can you say amen? amen? So at 10 years, here's what I want to encourage you. That you would be baptized afresh, individually and collectively, especially in times like this. We are living during one of the most broken, confused, and twisted generations. I don't say that in a derogatory way, but I say it as one that knows the times with a broken heart. When you see what children are dealing with, when you see that teen suicide it has, is at a low, you know all-time high, that at a tender age, there are people coming to a place of hopelessness. When you see the broken condition of the family or when you see all these things that you all know about and to think we're here for such a time. If we ever have to recapture the vision that God has for us, it's a day like today. And God wants to kick us out. He wants to so transform Western Christianity. Let me, let me give you a little bit. In April, I will be ministering in the Netherlands. And I've ministered in Europe. Europe, several hundred years ago, 500 years ago, was, a, was the very uh, bastion of awakening. The fires of revival. As the people of God were coming out of a thousand years of dark ages. And for the first time, could read for themselves the Bible in their own language. Do we take for granted? Many of us have 20 and 30 Bibles or whatever in our house. Can you imagine? And so the German boy was able to read in the German language the words of Jesus. Martin Luther spent two years translating the scriptures with the help of William Tyndale into the German language and he wanted to make it in such a common colloquial that he says the German plowboy will be more convinced Moses was German than he was Jewish. 
because, and then there was printing presses and everything. The technology, 60 years before he ever nailed uh, the 95 Thesis to the church door in, as they say, Wittenberg, there was Johann Gutenberg that literally invented the printing press with movable type. That was the technology and literally took us into what's called the modern age. Because knowledge and the possibility of learning literally leapt to another dimension because people can now learn to read. And the inordinate dependency upon an educated class of clergy was broken. And they no longer looked to a priesthood or individuals that whatever they say is right, but now they could read the scriptures for themselves. Can you say amen? And so it set Europe on fire as the gospel and the truths of the gospel was being restored and justification by faith and the, the universal priesthood of the believer. We take these things for granted, but it was earth-shaking revelation that I didn't, the priest was not my mediator. There was only one mediator between God and man, and I've got equal access because of the blood that was shed. Hallelujah. It set Europe on fire. It affected nations. It altered governments. And the children of the reformers got on a boat, and I'll be ministering in Leiden, Holland, where the pilgrims were before they came to America. They got on a boat, and they came here bearing their Bible. And you read the Mayflower Compact, read the earliest legal covenantal documents of this nation, and you'll read the desire, the intended desire, was that from these shores, the gospel of Jesus Christ can go forth. Amazing. Today, today, Europe is a bastion of humanism. It's the most spiritually dead geographical location by comparison to other places that are experiencing incredible revival. Many third world countries experiencing incredible moves of the spirit because it had become a culture. And this is the way we're going in Western Christianity here in America. Incredible. But God's got himself a remnant. God's got himself a lift church. And I want to just remind us that we are saved by grace through faith. And that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. And we usually stop right there and we're saved by grace. Oh no, that's what we're saved by. But you gotta read verse 10, you'll understand why we're saved for. For you are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus unto. See, I'm not just saved from, I'm saved for. Unto good works which he hath foreordained that I should walk in them. Man, that just thrills me. That I need all of this salvation to put my feet on the path God thought for my life before I was ever a manifested reality. Because I was walking on the wrong path. I was walking on paths of unrighteousness. But he now leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And so with that, I, I would just like us to turn to Nehemiah because I want to reinforce what God's put in my heart for this service is that at 10 years that there would be a fresh baptism upon you as individuals, upon you as families, and upon you collectively of a mindset that's necessary so you could be the people 
God's called you to be. The reason we go to the book of Nehemiah is because it is a book, one of the more premier books where the entire book is about restoration. It begins with no possible potential. But that's where God always loves to begin. He does. Look at creation. When God steps in on the scene, he steps in when things are dark and in chaotic form. And God loves to take center stage in situations like that. And he loves to bring light to darkness. And he likes to speak his word to chaotic things. And then all of a sudden, a process of beauty, the possibility of what could have been was there all the time, but it simply took God showing up and getting involved. And that's what he does to every life. Can you say amen? Amen. Don't ever think that your chaos, don't ever think that your problems, don't you dare waste your future with the should'ves and could'ves and if I could have, oh no, don't. Wherever you are, if you're hearing the sound of my voice, now is the best time to open wide the door and say, step into my darkness. Step into my chaos. Step into my problems. Step into my dysfunction. I don't hide it from you. I'm asking you to step into it. Because our God is a restorer. Our God, he said, I'll give them beauty for the ashes. I'll give them beauty. I'll bring something so beautiful out of something that's been so burned up and burned down, and I'll bring beauty out of it. That's our God. That's why we can't help jumping and dancing when we worship him. It's not because of the melody, and it's not because of the tune. It's because of the one we worship. Can you say amen? So what I'm going to do, and I said this in the first service, and I'm going to say it now. I'm not going to preach to you the book of Nehemiah, but I'm going to, I'm going to call these headlines of restoration, impressing upon every one of you that as I look at you, and you're so beautiful. You know what I found out? I found out when people get saved, the first thing we get delivered from is the uglies. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's the, it's the uglies. Uh, can, I, can I digress and, and just tell you this testimony? I'm in the Dominican Republic, and I was preaching in the morning, and then I was going back to my room to rest and preach. I was in Santiago, and I was going to preach in the evening. And I'll never forget, it was Super Bowl Sunday. And I think, if I remember correctly, It was Peyton Manning's last Super Bowl, number 50. And that was Super Bowl, he won, number 50. So I'm in a foreign country. I had a suit on and I had my briefcase. I got dropped off at the hotel. And as I'm in the hotel, two two guys from America are speaking. Well, when you're in a foreign land and someone's speaking English, you automatically feel connected. (laughs) It's just the way it is. So, and they're, they're talking about football. And, and one guy really seemed to know a lot, come to find out, he was an ex-NFL football player. Years back, he played for the Rams. And these guys discovered each other, you know, and they're talking. So I'm kind of lingering and I'm listening and I kind of join the conversation about football. And we're talking about football, we're talking about the Super Bowl and so on and so forth. And then, uh, and my late wife had just passed. I was married 34 years, and Karen and I served the Lord together, and I'm a man doubly blessed, really, and my present wife, Denise, could not be here, and it's not a rumor, I am married. (laughs) But back then, this was before Denise and Karen had passed, and so we're talking, and all of a sudden, one of them said, yeah, you know, I'm going to go to one of these clubs tonight. I want to meet a beautiful Latina. We went from Super Bowl to another conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I said, well, I said, uh, 
I gotta tell you, I said, my wife just passed. <laughs> you know, that'll change the conversation. <laughs> I said, and she was very beautiful. Really? Oh, sorry to hear that. Oh, yeah, I said she was. And uh, so <clears throat> he said, well, where did you all meet? So I said, actually, we, we met in the house of God. So this one guy that wants to go out and meet a Latina <laughs> said, now, he takes a look back, he looks at my suit, he's looking me up and down, and I got a briefcase. He goes, what do you do? <laughs> I thought, my cover is blown. You know? I said, well, I'm a preacher. He goes, I knew it, I knew it. <laughs> Rev, I knew it. Now he says, come on, Rev. They're not all beautiful in the house of God. That's what he said. I, I said, I'm tell you something. The one God has for you is beautiful. Yes. Come on, Rev. Yeah. He goes, come on, Rev. And he starts kind of joking with me. He said, you know, my mother's been praying for me. I said, really? I said, it just may be I'm an answer to that prayer. <laughs> oh, he said, Rev, come on, Rev. <laughs> So anyway, I encouraged them, and I just said, you know, and I, I gave Matthew 6, 33. I did. I said, if you'll put God first, obviously your mother's praying for you. The other guy's just listening. And he said his friend has a Bible study. He's from North Carolina. I said, when you get back, you should go visit that Bible study. I said, you never know. Maybe God's choice is in that Bible study. But when you put God first, he'll add everything, everything to your life. Oh, Rev, he said, thank you so much, you know. And we leave. So in the morning, I get up to have breakfast. And who comes, sits right across from me, is that guy. He said, Rev, I want you to know something. You messed up my plans for last night. I said, what are you talking about? He goes, I was all set to go to one of these clubs. And I couldn't get you out of my mind. He goes, what are the odds of me being in the Dominican Republic and me meeting an Italian preacher from New York? <laughs> so we kind of laughed. He said, but you know what, Rev? He said, uh, I couldn't stop thinking about what you said. And he said, my mother has been praying for me. And he said, and you're right, Rev. I said, well, listen. He said, <laughs> this is crazy. He said, but Rev, let me ask you a question. If I put God first, is he going to make me marry an ugly woman? I said, <laughs> I, said <clears throat> I said, absolutely. I said, absolutely not. No way. Because when you meet the woman God has for you, she's going to be so beautiful. It's exactly what you need. He said, Rev, thank you so much. And he left $200. He goes, keep preaching that word. And he left. Imagine that. When you put God first, he does. He adds everything unto you. When we go to Nehemiah, we find that God has a plan of restoration. But what I'm intrigued is how God brings this plan to pass. So we're going to read headlines of restoration that present truth to us. And we can see the unfolding of what it took. So when we go to Nehemiah, let's begin with our first headline. It's Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 3. And they said to me, the remnant that are left of the captivity in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is broken and the gates are burned with fire. How would you like that for your ministry calling? Everything's broken, everything's burned, and the people are discouraged. There's no potential. Nothing, no potential. But Nehemiah heard of the condition of the people. And he heard of the condition of what the enemy forces had done. He was unable to sleep. In fact, he fasted. He had turmoil in his spirit because God put in his heart to see a change come to that condition. I pray during this season of fasting that there would have been really the heart of God that would be given to you and as individuals, but also as a fellowship even more 
that you recognize you've come to the kingdom and to this area for such a broken generation. Can you say amen? So here we see the great beginning plot of restoration. No potential, everything's broken, everything's burned, and the remnant, they're in great, great distress. God begins with a few. That's all he ever needs. He begins with a few who are weak and hurting, but he sends to them a man that is burdened to see things change. Our insufficiency, and I want you to hear me, our insufficiency as individuals becomes literally the, the necessary ingredient for the miraculous. Our lack, our deficiency becomes the breeding ground where miracles could happen. So if you're hearing the sound of my voice, and it seems like even almost every day, you are so uh, discouraged by certain things in your life that seem so broken, that seem so out of sorts, you don't hide that. You give that to God. Amen. You surrender it to God. Amen. It is the breeding ground for the miraculous. Amen. Can you say amen? amen? We need to believe this because that's who's coming into the church. Problems are coming into the church. People that are confused in their identity are coming into the church. But they need to come into a place where people still believe in miracles. In fact, let me say this here. In the Old Testament, it was the Ark of the Covenant that always went before the people. When they crossed over the Jordan, it was the priest bearing the ark. The ark had staves in it because it was meant to be carried and meant to be mobile. But it was to always lead God's people where they were to go. What was inside that ark? Three elements. The table of testimony, which was the Ten Commandments. The golden pot of manna. And Aaron's rod that budded. All three of them came into existence by the miraculous and the supernatural. The tables of the Ten Commandments, the tables of stone, God wrote with his finger. Manna that came from heaven. And Aaron's rod that was cut off from its roots and still was able to bring forth fruit, which spoke of resurrection life and spiritual life, bringing forth fruit. What is God saying? God is saying, that he never intended his church to be able to make progress without the testimony of the miraculous. One of the biggest mistakes is when the church leaves the miracles behind. No, it's the testimony of the miracle working power of God that leads us into new territory. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. Second headline, Nehemiah chapter 2 and verse 10. When Samballot the Horonite and Tobiah the servant the Ammonite, when they heard of it, meaning Nehemiah, it grieved them because a man came seeking the welfare of the children of Israel. Let me tell you something. The enemy was there all the time, but he was not active. He didn't need to be active. The moment God inserted a leader that was concerned for the welfare of the people, that's when the enemy becomes active. And I tell you what, we've got to be, one of the things God is speaking to me is to restore the spirit of fight in God's people in these days. Our fight is not with flesh and blood. It's a spiritual fight, but it speaks of a disposition our God is a man of war, and there we've got to see the fight restored into our hearts and not just let the enemy rob and steal from us. Come on now. Because the enemy, God's work, always progresses in the face of opposition. 
read the book of Acts. In the face of persecution, in the face of everything that could be thrown at them, and yet Jesus said, upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The first thing Jesus said about his church, and we are his church together, but you're part of his church as an individual. That means this, this spiritual DNA is in you. Jesus said, it's unstoppable. It will be confronted, there will be enemy forces, but it will not be able to prevail against the forward advance of the church. Yes, Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. There came a man to seek the welfare of the children of Israel. One of the many reasons I so love your pastors is because what their heartbeat is. Their heartbeat is not about wanting to have the biggest church. Their heartbeat is not wanting this, that, or the other. Their heartbeat is to see people restored. Yeah. Their heartbeat is to see people saved, first and foremost, but to also see marriages saved, to also see children saved, to see lifetimes saved. And to that end, they said yes to the call of God. To that end, they committed themselves to a people. And to that end, you not only received them, but in like spirit, you said yes. And that, I'm gonna tell you something, you will rile up the enemy as long as your target is the restoration of lost humanity. Oh yes. There came a man seeking the welfare of the children of Israel. Number three, the enemy was mocking them. The enemy was telling them, you cannot finish the work you've started. You're a bunch of losers. Think about it. It says they mocked them and they scorned. So here they are working and all they hear is scorn and mocking and the mocking of the enemy. But I love what Nehemiah said in chapter two and verse 20. Then I said to them, the God of heaven, he will prosper us. Therefore, we, his servants, will arise and build. In other words, when we're doing God's work, we expect supernatural prosperity. And let me tell you something, I expect it because I know the nature of my father. That's why when pastor gets up and he teaches on first fruits giving and he teaches about what giving is and it's so very important, why? Because he is teaching you and sharing with you and sharing with us of how to live in another economy. It's called the economy of God and the kingdom economy. Jesus rebuked the Pharisees and he said, you keep the people from entering the kingdom because you've removed the key of knowledge. That's what he said. Knowledge is a key. I can never lay hold of something I don't know is available. And so thank God for a man and a woman and other leaders that you have that seek to bring the knowledge of God to you so that you could walk through that door because knowledge is a key. What does a key do? It unlocks something, a door that might have been shut to you and suddenly a door now is open because you see something of the nature of God, something of the provision of God. And now we could enter the kingdom door by door, measure by measure. We can move in doors of healing. We can move in doors of prosperity. We can move in doors of deliverance. It's all in the kingdom. And my God shall meet all of your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Can you say amen? And we are coming to a point where it's going to be absolutely crucial that we learn to live in the kingdom while we're here on earth. And we learn to live in the marvelous provisions of the Lord. He goes on to say, God will prosper us. Therefore, we will not stop building. In other words, we're going to stay doing God's will 
and God will prosper us. I put it this way. If it's God's will, it's God's bill. You see, Satan may never be able to tempt you to backslide, but he could tempt you to give yourself to doing what God never called you to do. That's why it's so incredibly important to have a sense of what God said and be faithful to it. Be faithful to it. Because he will prosperity. Prosperity is not just an amount of money. It is the completion of a journey. It's God giving you everything that you need to do what he's called you to do. So my responsibility is to know what he's called me to do and do it. It's his responsibility to meet every need so it could be done. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. He goes on to say, and this is what I love the most, Nehemiah chapter three. I want to turn there. Only a few more minutes, but I want to turn there. Nehemiah chapter three. There is a repeated phrase, and it's describing all of them that are involved in the work. And it's the phrase found in verse two, and next unto him. Would you say that with me? And next unto him. Builded the men of Jericho, and next to them, Build it, Zachar, verse four. And next to them, verse five. And next to them, verse seven. And next to them, verse eight. And next to him, repaired, verse nine. And next to them, repaired, next to verse 10. And next to them, repaired. And all the different reparations that were made in all the different gates, all the different parts of the wall, But as each one with their appropriate tool was working on the sheep gate, the water gate, the different gates, the fish gate, and different parts of the wall, they were working next to one another. I can't emphasize that enough. There is an aberrant belief today that you could somehow love Jesus but not have to be part of the body. You might as well read a different Bible because there's, that is far into the scriptures. Who are you next to? You've been ordained to be next to somebody. You've been ordained to labor. Paul said, know those who labor among you. You have not been brought here or called here to just receive but to be part of the, rep, the reparations, to be part of, there are tools you have. And you know, I wanna encourage you, you get active, you get serving. You take the courses and first principles, foundations and start serving. Someone said, how do you know what you're called to do? Start serving. It will soon be revealed. It will. Suddenly, the grace that's upon your life begins to, pro, begins to come forth like cream to the surface. You just start serving. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it. But as you do it, suddenly, and as you're serving, it will become more clear and more clear of the grace and the tools and the gifts that God has granted It'll be confirmed with prophecy. It will be confirmed all along the way. But I want to say this to you. Every one of you, this is what Paul says. He said, ye are the body of Christ, members in particular. So in other words, even being next to each other, you don't lose your sense of personal worth or identity, but you've got to see yourself in the scheme of what God has called you to do, being next to somebody else. And then protect those relationships. Discern them, protect them, nurture them, feed them. Because that's what the enemy, how does the enemy seek to stop? It's called divide and conquer. He tries to bring division. 
But we find in Nehemiah 3, they were next to each other. And the Bible says in Nehemiah then in 4, how were they laboring together? For the people had a mind to work, Nehemiah 4, 6. In other words, not just minds, a mind. They came under, I believe that speaks of the overall vision. They came under the mind. What's God's mind for this city? What's God's mind for Jerusalem? What's God's mind for this wall? And what I love it, it says the people had a mind singular to work. In other words, they gave up their ideas and they said, we're gonna have one mind. As Paul prayed, I pray you have one mind and one mouth whereby you glorify God. In other words, that you would all speak the same thing. Hallelujah. One of the reasons I love Lift Church is because I hear the heart of this fellowship in song. I hear it when pastor speaks. You sing about it. You testify about it. You preach about it. Speaking the same thing. And what is that? The mind of God as to why he brought us together. Yeah. Hallelujah. Well, there came a point when they were working, when they got tired. And the enemy seemed like they were really penetrating. Remember, it was in the midst of trouble. It was in the midst of constant bombardment of mockery and scorn. And finally, it seems like the nobles, they came to Nehemiah, they said the people are tired. They're done. And the, hall, the wall was only halfway built. And what intrigues me is what that man of God did. He said, I want a meeting with everybody. And they called everybody. And it says these words in Nehemiah chapter four, verse 17, uh, verse 14. He said, I looked and I rose up, this Nehemiah, and I said to the nobles, to the rulers, and to all the rest of the people, don't you be afraid of the enemy. Remember God, he's great. And fight for each other. Fight for your sons. Fight for your daughters. Fight for your wives. Fight for your houses. What did he do? He reminded them the value of the fight. He reminded them of the value for the sacrifice. It's quite possible. Did you ever get weary? Did you ever get tired? But I love what Nehemiah did. He baptized them afresh with the overall reason why we're doing what we're doing. It's for your children's sake. How many know there are some things worth fighting for? It's for their generation. It's for my family. I realize the forces that we are facing, but I'm gonna to continue to give. I'm gonna to continue to be at Monday prayer meeting. I'm gonna make first things first. Why? Because we're in a fight. And it's worth the fight because the outcome and the consequence of us staying in the fight is redemption, salvation and the restoration of broken generations. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory. Yes. Hallelujah. My, my, my. And as a result, they heard that word, and then he put a tool in all of their hands, and he put a weapon in all their hands. Now you fight, and you build, and you fight, and you build and you stand your watch, and you rebuke the enemy, and you intercede, and you continue to work, and you continue to believe, and you continue to pray, watch and pray, Jesus, and you continue to do that. And finally, when everything was done, Nehemiah 6.16, and it came to pass, when all our enemies heard thereof, and all the heathen about us saw these things, they were cast down in their own eyes, for then they perceived this was a work of God. Even the, even the enemies had to admit this is God's work. 
these few people, these few people, how could they have done? There's wisdom revealed to us in this story. And we translate it now like Nehemiah. You and I are serving and living in the midst of such brokenness. But God is looking for, literally, he's looking for a remnant and of, of restoration agents, I call them, agents of restoration to the point where you say, not on my watch. No, no, no. No, on my watch, we're going to build, we're going to fight, we're going to believe, we're going to pray. We're going to say, Pastor, you go for it. Got your back. I'm going to say to my neighbor, your battle becomes my war. We're going to love one another. We're going to serve one another. We're going to do this thing that Jesus told us to do. And we're going to be the church by his grace. It's not by might nor power, but by his spirit, saith the Lord. Can you say amen? Stand with me to your feet. Hallelujah. My God, you've come this far by faith. But you are now positioned, as our dear brother Lonnie said, you are now positioned to go into even the deeper realms of God's purposes at your 10 year. There are things, well, I feel the spirit of prophecy come on me now. <clears throat> Hallelujah. There are doors that are about to open that you were not prepared for. Before this time, there's going to be doors of provision and there's going to be doors that had seemed shut that suddenly, and I'm hearing this, will open of its own accord. What I'm hearing in the spirit is after 10 years, God has for himself a prepared people to bring you into something that's been prepared for you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lift your hands. Oh, Jesus. Jesus, we give you all the praise and all the glory. I pray a fresh baptism right now. Come upon you. Come upon families, husbands and wives. That all of you at this 10-year mark receive something fresh in your lives in your marriage, young people, that the Spirit of God will come upon you in a fresh way. And as a result, a passion and a zeal in your heart to want to do the will of God, to want to fulfill the call of God. Presence of God is here right now. I sense His power and His presence. Hallelujah. Just give me a few more minutes. Just a few. You've been so kind and so attentive to the word of the Lord. I want to lead us in a prayer of receptivity. That standing here together on this Sunday morning at the Lift Church, I include myself, I'm with you. That together we would pray a prayer ready to receive at this time the power of the Holy Spirit, the revelation of the Spirit, and the next phase of his transformation so that from here we could step into the very next thing that God has. Pray with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I lay your word to my heart. And I receive your word. May it go down deep into the very spirit and fiber of my life. Baptize me. Fully immerse me with the sense of your purpose and vision. I invite you into the areas that need change. 
because you're a God of restoration. You make crooked things straight. And so I invite you in. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Holy Spirit, I receive your power and your revelation to lead me and guide me that you might transform me so I might become all that God has envisioned for my life. It's not by might nor by power but it is by your spirit and I receive it today in Jesus name hallelujah give him glory hallelujah may the grace of God be upon every one of you you're a precious people. You're a beautiful family. Happy anniversary. God's got great things in store. Do you believe it? Yes. Pastor, come. Amen. Come on. Bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Phil. Wow, wasn't that incredible? Yes. Thank God. How many saw yourself there working that wall? You're going to build it up, going to build it up. Somebody lift your hands. I'm going to do my part. And the wall is going to be rebuilt and the gates are going to be reset. And praise God, we're going to see, we're going to see his kingdom come and his will done. Thank you, Jesus. There's a prophetic blanket in here right now. You may not understand that. You may not understand the phrase. You don't have to understand it to receive it, though. Just as you prayed just now, just receive it. Just receive it in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus, over your life, over your family. Go ahead. Just take a second more and praise him. Hallelujah. Just praise him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Come on. That's it. That's it. If you're headed to a restaurant, you've already missed the first wave. So, hallelujah. Just relax. Just relax. Just receive from the Lord all he's got for you. Hallelujah. 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 This is our 10th anniversary. Lord, we thank you for where you brought us from. We thank you. We received the prophetic word that, that, Lord, you have been preparing us for something you prepared for us. And at 10, we step into it. We step into a new dimension. We step into a new phase a new level. We thank you for it, Lord. Father, I thank you that that's not just true of the house corporately, collectively, but it is, as it is true of the collective house, it is also true of individual houses, and we praise you for bringing families into their next. In the name of Jesus, we worship you, and we glorify your name. And we magnify you, Jesus. Will you reach over, just take somebody by the hand. Will you just pray a prayer of blessing upon them right now? Just pray a prayer of blessing. If you're not sure if they're born again, ask them. Ask them and say, let me pray with you. Let's pray together right now in the name of Jesus. Pray Lord healing. Jesus, pray breakthrough. Pray deliverance. Prepare me. Oh, thank you, Lord. What you prepare for
Father, I thank you. I thank you for power, for revelation, for transformation in our lives. Lord, I thank you for working deeply and wonderfully in everyone. I thank you, Lord, as your people have obeyed you or are in the process of obeying you in giving a first fruits offering. I thank you, Lord, as they prayed together, as they, as they submitted it to you, as they spoke prophetically over it. Lord, I just join my faith. Margie and I join our faith with every person's faith that this will be in spite of what the natural world says and looks like in spite of the circumstances in spite of all the insufficiencies around us we just declare that this will be a year when the enemy will indeed look at our lives and say this certainly has been a work of God a work of God and we could not stop it. Lord, I thank you for it. We pray it over every individual, over every family. In the name of Jesus and over this house, we give you thanks for it. We give you praise in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I want to ask you, every head bowed, every eye closed, is there any one person who would just slip your hand up and say, Pastor, today is a day when I am giving my life to Christ. I'm coming back to him. I'm surrendering fresh to him, whatever the case may be. But today is the day when I say yes, fully and completely to the Lord Jesus. The Bible said we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. If that's your testimony, will you just slip your hand really high, really high. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God for that hand. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come on. Can we give the Lord a shout of praise? Can we give the Lord a shout of praise. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. I've got a little, I've got a little book I want to give to you. Do you mind to just lift your hand one more time? You lift your yeah, yes, please. Someone Christian's gonna come back. You got something I want to bless you with. Because we want to. We want to be part of the rest of the journey. Come on, give the Lord a shout. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Well, glory to, isn't Jesus good? Come on, aren't you thankful? Hallelujah. Well, I love you. Everybody say tomorrow night. You don't want to miss tomorrow night. We're going to flow prophetically in worship. And then man of God's going to minister. And I believe it's going to be a prophetic release hallelujah hallelujah a tsunami i believe hallelujah there's gonna be a tsunami released in this place over the next two days thank you jesus there is outside a a big banner there uh of, it's a photo op for you and your family please take some photos share it on social media help us celebrate and brag on Jesus and look good while you're doing it. Amen. May the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of the Father, the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. In Jesus' name. God bless you. See you tomorrow night.